Hi everyone, welcome to In Deep Geek Live. I hope you're all staying uh, well and healthy. Um, today is the next in a series of live streams that I've been doing, looking at characters in the Winds of Winter. We've been working our way through the Starks, we've done Sansa, we've done Arya, uh, we did John a couple of weeks ago. Today we're looking at Bran. What's going on with Bran uh, in the next book of Song of Ice and Fire. So as always, what I'm going to do is I'm going to structure this around questions that I've had from my patrons. I will try and get to as many questions as I possibly can from the live chat as we're going through. Um, uh, but to start with, I think it's probably useful to just set out where Bran is. It's always a little bit confusing when we're trying to, we, we've got the show in our memory and we just need to remember where characters are in the books. So Bran, as we're coming up to the Winds of Winter, he's heading north, or he has headed north. He's gone beyond the wall. He went there in that small group with Jojen and Mira and Osha and Rickon and um, Hodor, of course. Now, uh, Osha and Rickon have headed off. They've gone off to uh, probably Skagos. And then uh, when uh, uh, Bran gets north of the wall, they eventually make it up to Blood Raven's Cave. They make it there with the help of Cold Hands. On the show, they kind of merge that character with Benjen, and he gets up to the wall, and now he's uh, starting to learn how to be a tree wizard, basically. He gets this paste, this kind of red, horrible-sounding paste uh, that he eats, and this opens up his magical mind. And this allows him access into the Weirwood network. And through that, he's starting to now see not just what's happening at the moment, but he can also go back through time, see things that are happening in the past. And we've had a series of visions of him looking through the Winterfell Weirwood tree, where he can now also not just see things that are happening, but start to slowly interact in a way. Not in a huge way, but he can say stuff and people can sort of turn around and go, what, hang, what, what was that? And so that is where he is. He's in uh, Blood Raven's caves. Mira is there. Hodor is there. He is quite regularly using Hodor to go and explore these caves. There's a whole load of massive these caves. There's a whole load of old children of the forest hooked up to the weirwood roots there as well. And that is where we've left him. So that's the situation. Obviously, we now know what happened in the show. I think, as a sort of a, an overall heading here, I think roughly what happened on the show is going to be happening in the books, by which I mean he is not going to stay there forever. He is going to come down to Winterfell. And after Winterfell, I personally think that he will end up being king. We'll get into that in a... I'm sure later on in this, but that that's the overarching thing. The details will be very different, but as an overarching character um, narrative, that's where I think we are going. So, um, let's just quickly dip into the chat. Uh, Derry, thank you so much for the uh, super chat. Didn't see a question attached to that one, uh, but thank you. I very much appreciate that. And thank you uh, also, had a couple of Super Chats before I went live. Googly Woogly, fantastic name, saying looking forward to it. Uh, Victoria Gill left a super sticker. Thank you, I very much appreciate it. And uh, Maura Lee saying a show of love, support and appreciation for all your amazing content. This is helping to keep me sane and entertained. Thank you, Maura. I hugely appreciate your support. And that's basically what I'm trying to do, is just trying to keep everyone sane and entertained. It's a uh, it's a humble aim, but I hope that we're trying to get there. Um, OK, so let's start with uh, a question from Megasandra, uh, who is saying there are very clear parallels between Bran's experience ingesting the weirwood paste, which is what I was talking about just a moment ago, and Danny's experiences with the shade of the evening in the House of the Undying, the awful taste progressively becoming better, etc., except that Danny sees past, present and alternate future visions and Bran seems to see a rewind. Is there some connection between the shade of the evening trees and weirwoods? Will there have been some connection with Euron, who's been uh, using the shade of the evening, and Bran, um, who was chosen by the three-eyed crow? Fantastic way to start this. So what we've got is 
um, for those who, uh, it was a long time ago in the books, but when Danny goes to, uh, she's in Carth and she goes to the House of the Undying, she's going there to get knowledge and all the rest of it. When she gets in, she does, she, she sees lots of visions and these visions seem quite true. Yes, there are a couple that are from alternate futures, but a lot of them are also from what has happened in the past, what will happen in the future, and seem very truthful. So that was, was what was going on with Denny. But before she went in, in order to sort of unlock this, she had to have this paste which was made from these Shade of the Evening Trees, which were all around the outside of this House of the Undying. The imagery of these trees is deliberately opposite to the imagery we have from the weirwoods. So uh, blue leaves rather than red, black um, uh, bark rather than white. Uh, and it's, they, they seem to be deliberately opposite. We don't see any weirwoods over on Essos. We don't see any shadow the evening trees over on Westeros. So there seems to be um, some sort of comparison being put between the two. However, the taste of this paste that they have to ingest does seem very similar. The, George R. R. Martin does this uh, fantastically well in terms of his writing. Is that he just describes stuff and he allows you to make connections between the two. And so Bran, when he, he has this uh, from the Weirwood tree, this seems to, he describes in detail what it's like. And it's like, it starts off quite, quite bitter, but then it's got nice taste uh, and then he gets like memories of things that he really likes uh, and it sort of like alternates be between lots of different things. Danny is exactly the same. So clearly they are very similar and we don't know the exact background here but we're left to assume that they're different versions or perhaps opposite versions of the same kind of thing that's going on. Now, the question with Euron is quite an important one because Euron, obviously in the books, a much bigger character. Euron has been taking a lot of this. He, he captured a barrel of the stuff. The, uh, the backstory is that after Danny had sort of gone away and burnt, burnt down the House of the Undying, a few of the warlocks there, they chased her down or tried to chase her down. They took with them a barrel of this stuff because this was the source of their magic. Um, Euron captured them and he's now got the barrel and he's been using this to do all his tripping and getting all his visions. Now, there are hints, I've done videos on this in the past, but there are hints that Euron has got some sort of green seer abilities. It seems that perhaps he may well have been even visited by blood raven in the past and uh even when you kind of think like that the imagery the one eye the uh the ravens and all the rest of it the the crows these are very much blood raven images that euron has taken however he did not go on and uh, go up north of the wall and get trained and all the rest of it what he did was he then unlocked his magical powers through the shade of the evening, which makes him a sort of an anti-Bran, as it were. So that is the kind of scenario that we're coming up with here, is we've got Bran, and then we've got Euron, who's this kind of like bad magic user who's the sort of the opposite of Bran. So oh, is there going to be some kind of confrontation? Almost certainly, but not yet. We have to wait, I suspect, until the very end of it. I think if you, if you, Get in your mind that Euron is the Saruman figure in this. He's not the big bad, but he is. He, he needs dealing with. So uh, once we've dealt with the others, that's when we finally, finally have to do away with uh, Euron slash Saruman. So that's that's the situation. Yes, there will be some kind of confrontation. Yes, there's clear, clearly, I think, clearly a link between the two. Um, and it's it's like they're opposites. Um, uh, Christy Voltson, thank you. Uh, moderators, thank you, I should say. Uh, I, my moderators do a fantastic job, uh, uh, not just on this channel, but on many other 
uh, channels as well. Uh, so thank you, Chrissy, for picking up the question from the super chat from Derry, saying, how does the existence of Southern Godswoods impact how much Bran can see? Um, uh, the uh, the World of Ice and Fire and Fire and Blood, Blood both reference many weirwoods in the south. Yeah, there's not many weirwoods in the south, but there are definitely some. So we, uh, we've we definitely got, so the Isle of Faces, there's a lot on there. And then there's a sort of a, a crescent, if you think, you know, sort of a picture on, on a map. You've got this kind of crescent that comes down from the neck through places like uh, Old Stones, um, through Raven Tree Hall. There's obviously, it's unfortunately now dead, but there's got a massive weirwood tree there. Uh, then we get High Heart. There were weirwood trees there, a lot of them. They've been chopped down. Uh, and this kind of like comes in this arc all the way down to the Isle of Faces. So there are definitely weirwood trees there. There are also weirwood trees in random places uh, like Casterly Rock, um, uh, Harren Hall obviously had lots of uh, weirwood tree or a, a weirwood tree there. Um, so there are weirwood trees, but not as many as there are in the north. So that's that's the kind of the situation. They're more, other than some bits of the Riverlands that have stayed worshipping the old gods, they are more cultivated in the south. They don't seem to be uh, any or many at all in Dawn. If it's an area is over open seas, then it doesn't have any. If it's somewhere atop a mountain, then it doesn't have any. That's why the Erie, they just couldn't grow a weirwood tree there. There are none um, in the Iron Islands. These, so it's, there, there are some, but not huge amounts. In terms of the, whether that um, uh, affects what he can see, um, certainly in the short term, yes, but what Blood Raven says to Bran is that you will be able to go beyond the weirwood trees. So it's not just a matter of like he can only see what's there from the weirwood trees, you will be able to go beyond. So at the moment, yes, that does impinge on what's what he can do, but in the future, no, he's going to be even more powerful, so he should be able to uh, see beyond them. Um, Vigstable, thank you for the super chat, saying, will Bran meet Howland Reed before returning to Winterfell? How do you think that will play out? I don't think he will meet him before coming back to Winterfell. So, so Howland Reed is in the neck at the moment. He is at Greywater Watch, which is the ancestral home of House Reed. And what seems to be uh, being set up is... Rob Stark, before he died, he sent off a couple of people with his will to go and try and find um, Howland Reed. Now, uh, these um, these are Mage Mormont, and oh, I think it's Galbert Glover, one of the Glovers anyway, and uh, they have disappeared for a couple of books. We don't know where they are, but the implication is that they will at some point head up north probably with Howland Reed, and he will probably meet Bran at Winterfell. George R. R. Martin has confirmed we will meet Howland Reed, hallelujah, we will eventually meet him. We just haven't met him yet because he knows too much about the plot, so don't expect him to appear, I think, until A Dream of Spring, maybe at the very end of The Winds of Winter, but not until near the end of the story. So I don't think he's going to go north of the wall to meet Bran. I think he's going to go to Winterfell. And at that point, he will impart the knowledge that he has. So that's that's the kind of the iteration that, that we're looking at, I think, in terms of how and read. Um, had a question from um, Connor Shields. Love all of your work. Opinion on Jojen Paste. Okay, Jojen Paste, for those who do not know, this is, I talked earlier about this paste that Bran has to ingest, has to eat in order for him to sort of open up his mind to the magic that he has. Now, that, when he eats it, he thinks, it's icky, it's red, it's a bit veiny. Uh, and uh, this makes people go, oh, 
is there a human sacrifice involved here? Yes, this is probably some kind of weirwood sap, but is there sacrifice? And that would make sense because all magic in the world of ice and fire seems to involve sacrifice in some way. The weirwood trees in particular seem to involve, the, their magic seems to involve uh, sacrifice. We see it when Bran goes back in time, he sees a sacrifice before the weirwood tree. Even Ned Stark seems to, in front of the weirwood tree, whenever he executes somebody with the sword ice, he washes it off in the pool in front of the weirwood tree as if he's making a sacrifice. So sacrifice does seem to be a part of what's going on here. And that is connected to the fact that Jojen has mysteriously disappeared. And not only has he mysteriously disappeared, but he seems to have when he was sort of like, he, he has visions of the future, he has dreams. Uh, he doesn't see himself as going, coming back. That, that seems to be it. He seems to think he has got a purpose and that his purpose is to take Bran up to Blood Raven's cave and then he's going to fulfill his duty. And Mira seems to be moping around and Jojen appears to be disappearing. So the question is, is this rather veiny paste? Is this Jojen as a sacrifice? My best guess is yes, I think it is. Uh, it's dark, it's not nice to think about, but all the clues seem to suggest it. I would put it this way, I'd be surprised if Jojen suddenly reappears in the next book and goes, surprise, I've just been... Uh, the children of the forest were looking after me. Sorry, I've been quiet for a while. Let's go back. That doesn't seem to be likely to be what's going on, though. This does seem to have been a sacrifice, and Jojen is the most likely person uh, to be that sacrifice. Um, let's have a look. I think I had one, maybe a couple more questions in the chat. Let's see if I can get to them. Um, Brandon Winslow saying, uh, my question won't fit here. Please look in the chat for the full question. Thanks for everything you do. Uh, thank you very much. I will have a very quick look here. Um, okay. So uh, Brandon Winslow says, I'm doing my sixth or seventh reread of the series, and I noticed that Blood Raven, unlike Bran or Rickon in Jojen's Dream, actually acts like a crow and asks Bran for corn, pecks him, etc. It feels like it's different. Um, I liked your theory, but this is sticking with me. I'm still keen to believe that Blood Raven equals a 3A crow, but I think it's odd that he would act like a crow in Bran's dreams and not remember it. Any ideas? Okay, so um, this all boils down to a, a few questions that, that some people within the community have queried whether the person hooked up that Bran meets, the person hooked up there is Blood Raven. They've queried whether the person who was there was the person who was dealing with Bran in Bran's visions. Um, my take is that it's actually exactly as we think it is. Now, um, whether this is Blood Raven, it seems reasonably clear from the uh, the explanations that we've got, so the description we've got, in fact, of somebody with this white skin with one eye, a, a red eye. He talks, he says that his name was Brynden. He, he, I mean, he, everything about him says this is Blood Raven, this is Brynden, Brynden Rivers. There's, there's, in my mind, there's absolutely no doubt that that character hooked up to that tree is Brynden Rivers. The sort of the, 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 Second potential objection is that it wasn't him who was talking to Bran through the visions. Now, this seems to, the crux of this seems to come from this question that um, when Bran says, are you the three-eyed crow, he says, huh, oh, well, I suppose that would make sense, uh, rather than, uh, yes, of course, that's me, that's who I am. And this seems to be, in my mind, a misunderstanding of how this kind of astral plane works, how these kind of green dreams operate. And the fact is, you do not know how you come across in these, and you do not necessarily um, control 
exactly how you come across and how you present yourself. So, for example, um, Bran is there. Um, he does not know that he comes across as a winged wolf. That's not, he just doesn't know that at all. Uh, and in, so we get, um, and Bloodraven doesn't know that that's who it is. He just sees this avatar, as, it's, as you might call it, of a winged wolf, and he sends the reeds to go and find the, the winged wolf. Now, Bloodraven doesn't know that he comes across as a three-eyed crow, but he kind of thinks, actually, you know what, that kind of makes sense. I was a crow, uh, three eyes, yes, because, you know, two-eyed crow plus the extra third eye, that, again, that kind of makes sense. So he does not know how he comes across. And so he also does not know how he comes across in terms of how he presents himself. He doesn't, uh, within this astral plane, he doesn't talk like a normal human in the same way that Bran as the, the winged wolf talks like a normal human. That's not how it works. You are not actually actively in control of how you come across. You just put your sort of your feeling and emotion into it. That's the way this seems to be. So, um, yeah, I understand the the question and the query. It's, it's de it is deliberately confusing. I think George R. R. Martin has made it deliberately confusing, but everything we've seen backs up the idea that this is Blood Raven and uh, that the character who was trying to contact him was Blood Raven. Because fundamentally, he was calling to him. Bran came and he said, Great, you're here. That, that, if, if not, then he was shouting out into the nothingness and then Bran mir miraculously appeared. Uh, so it all ties together that it was him. Um, Ash Naseby, thank you for the super chat, saying, do you think Patchface is one of Bloodraven's fallen dreamers? Cheers for all the entertainment over the years. Well, you're very welcome. Um, in terms of Patchface, oh, at some point I need to do a full video on Patchface because people do ask about Patchface quite a lot. And there is a lot going on there. So... Um, in terms of Fallen Dreamers, what seems to have happened is that um, if you go all the way back to Bran's original visions, um, he is he's falling, and then uh, the the crow is saying to him, "Fly! You should fly!" Uh, and eventually, he kind of does, and that's an indication that he is magical. He hasn't awoken all of his magic yet, but that's an indication of, of being magical. However, Bran sees that there are lots of dead bodies lying about on the floor. The clear implication being these are, as you say, fallen dreamers. These are people who uh, Bloodraven contacted and it just did not work. So is Hatchface, who is, for those, he's not a show character. He's a book-only character. He's this, he's a fool. Uh, and he's a fool, uh, for Stannis' fool, actually, technically, um, although mostly it's um, it's for uh, his daughter. So Stannis is not really a person who suffers fools gladly, uh, so to speak. So, um, But uh, he is there, and he does appear to be probably quite insane, but at the same time, there there is more than a hint that what he says shows some kind of prophetic leanings. Does this make him one of Bran's um, fallen dreams? I don't think it necessarily does. I think that um, there's a very good chance that there is some sort of water magic going on there. Now, we, we think about fire magic, we think about the magic of the old gods, we don't tend to think about water magic huge amounts, but the water magic is definitely a real thing. The Roinar had huge amounts of water magic, so it's entirely possible that that was what was going on there, and he was kind of like uh, resurrected from there, and that gave him some kind of magical powers. I don't think the fact that he can kind of see things of the, of the future and what's going on means that he has to be connected to Blood Raven. So um, I, I tend to think not. And I think the other thing that kind of adds into that is that Blood Raven's reach does seem to be restricted to Westeros. And Patchface initially came from Essos. He was 
brought across from Essos. So um, uh, I think the short answer is no. I mean, it's possible. We don't know huge amounts about uh, patch face, so I can't categorically say no, but all the evidence suggests probably not. Um, okay, let's have a quick flip through, uh, make sure I've not missed any more questions. I don't think so. Okay, let's uh, head back to a question. Oh, I have got one more, a um, couple more questions. <laughs> there we go, um, been missing a lot. Okay, so a couple more questions. One from Dominic Vaughan saying, hi, Robert, once someone is assumed into the weirwood hive mind, how much agency do they have? Will Bran be at their mercy or will he be able to influence? Um, so all we have to go on is Bloodraven himself. Now, Bloodraven has been hooked up to the weirwood network for quite some time now, decades. So um, uh, what we see when Bran arrives is someone who most of their time is just hooked up doing the Weirwood Network stuff, but he can still engage with Bran, and he still has memories of who he once was and a degree of understanding of that and retaining a bit of who he was. So he talks about his past, he talks about um, you know, he once had a, a brother he loved, a brother he hated, a sister that he loved, things like that. So uh, he does have a connection with who he is. However, most of the time he is just hooked up to the Weirwood Network. So that's all we've got to go on, really, in terms of what it looks like. Now, Bran is going to be slightly different in this story in that however it pans out, think it's going to be roughly the same is that he will become a part of this and yet have to escape from Blood Raven's cave and head down south. So he is not like unlike Blood Raven, he is not going to get literally hooked up into the Weirwood tree. Because that's what's happened with Blood Raven. He's there connect the roots around him like there's a root literally coming out through his eye things like that he is now a part of it bran is not going to be the same but he is going to be this green seer so it's not that he is going to be completely subsumed however to a degree it's going to be as we saw on the show it to a degree he is he's going to retain a bit of brannishness but the Weirwood Network is going to be working through him. It's probably the best way of saying it. So will he be at their mercy? I don't think it's a matter of being at their mercy. Will he be able to influence? Well, yes, because the Weirwood Network is just this culmination of people being added to it, or Children of the Forest being added to it over time, and Bran will be added into that. So he will have an influence. It's just that it won't just be ran these days. Um, uh, Dogo Doyer saying, thank you for the super chat, saying abstract question. What would a Hodor POV chapter be like? Does he know in the present that he is or was going to hold the door? Love your content. Thank you. This does remind me of um, <laughs> George R. R. Martin himself, actually. I think it was him. Um, or it was a very good pastiche, released a page of a Hodor POV chapter that just said, Hodor, 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 um, <laughs> which I thought was fantastic. But um, in terms of what his sort of POV is like, what does he know? Um, I think it's really hard to say. Does he, is he knowing that he always is going to hold the door quite possibly um we don't know exactly how it's going to play out on in the books um it's not going to be exactly the same as on the show i say this so many times but it's not going to be exactly the same as on the show but it's going to be roughly the same in the sense that he will be holding the door and this will be ran in the past and in the present trying to tell him to hold the door and that will affect Bran, uh, so affect Hodor in the past and make him the person that he is and this kind of closed time loop thing going on. 
and lead him to say Hodor. That means that Hodor all through his life has always been trapped in this moment of holding the door. Um, but he has been, um, he is still capable of thought. He obviously can react to things. He can be scared of stuff. He can be excited about stuff. He can like things and dislike things. Um, it's not that he's he's completely devoid of any emotion. He is there. However, his emotions seem to be very much in the present. It's He seems not to be able to, as far as we can tell, because we've not seen huge amounts, he seems not to be able to have much by way of abstract thought, we're asking an abstract question here, it seems very much in the present. When Bran goes into his mind, Hodor escapes into the corner and kind of cowers. Um, uh, we see that he grabs a sword and he kind of swishes it around excitedly. Um, when, uh, when he needs to be quiet, then he often makes a lot of noise because he's scared. Uh, and he doesn't understand when people are trying to reason with him. So he he is still in there, but he seems to be just living in the present, which is perhaps an abstract answer to an abstract question, but that's the most we have to go on at the moment. We've never had one, so we don't know exactly what it is, but the, the nature of this kind of closed time loop that Bran seems to have put him into means that he is forever trapped in some way in that moment. Um, let's have a quick look. Did I get, uh, I think I did get one more question before I get back to my, uh, patrons. And that is from Vigstable. Thank you so much saying since Bran becomes king, but is not really Bran anymore. Did the Weirwoods win the game of Thrones on the show? Yes. I think there's no two ways around that. That was basically what they were saying was that on the show, this was Bran as an agent of the Weirwood Network um, and the Weirwood Network won. That that was what it was. In the books, I, probably yes again. I think it will be clearer in the books what is going on um, in the sense that on the show, it did just feel like it, this was just Bran lost a bit of himself and he was just a little bit monosyllabic and all the rest of it. But in in the books, I think it'll be a whole lot clearer what's going on, that this is the grand plan from the Weirwood Network. Uh, and yes, it will be Bran sat there, I think, on the throne at the end of this, but it, this is the Weirwood Network having won. So yes, the Weirwoods did win the Game of Thrones, um, but I don't think they thought of it as the Game of Thrones. That's not how they operate and also i don't think because they're not operating the weirwood network doesn't operate on a past present future basis it's just um, everything is in the now they just thought that was always that was what was going to happen and it was just a matter of filling in the gaps until it actually did happen so it's slightly meta but that seems to be the, the position Okay, so let's try and get back to a couple more questions from my patrons. Uh, Peter Pebble says, how far is Bran going to go down a dark path? Skin changing Hodor, eating humans, etc. before turning back. How do you think his turning away from being evil Bran is going to happen? Okay, so Bran, yes, has been going down a dark path in the books um and we see this actually um when we get varamir six skins chapters we find that there are rules of being a skin changer there are clear rules that you you don't go into some other human's body you don't when you're in the body of an animal you don't eat human flesh things like that and bran has been breaking those rules because nobody's been teaching him about how to be a skin changer and um, when you think about what he's doing with Hodor, he goes into his mind without asking Hodor and just uses him. And that that feels quite bad. Um, what I think we're going to end up with, Brand George R. R. Martin doesn't 
operate in this good and evil way. That's not quite how he operates. He sees things in sort of layers of nuance and all the rest of it. I think Bran will end up heading towards where Blood Raven is and has been, which is thinking that they know what is best for the kingdom and therefore uh, some small uh, evil acts can be done if it is helping to contribute towards the greater good. And I think Bran, over time, and he will still remain a child throughout this story, let's not forget this, he is still going to remain a child throughout this story, so he's not going to be fully developed in all of his moral thinking and all the rest of it. But I think he's going to head more and more towards this moral gray area. So the question is saying, how will he turn away from being evil Bran? I think that that's sort of the wrong question. He is going to carry on doing evil acts, acts that we might consider to be evil, but they, I suspect, will be increasingly with a view to because Bran thinks that there is a greater good that they are contributing towards. Um, George R. Martin does not do moral absolutes. Uh, Turbo says, does 5G cause grayscale? No. Um, <laughs> that's, um, no. Uh, <laughs> thank, you. thank you for that. That's a helpful contribution. Um, uh, Maura Lee says, during Bran's training, will he get to astrally travel? in order to spy on the others. Possibly. Now, one of the things that George R. R. Martin has promised us about the Winds of Winter is that we will travel further north than we have so far. Now, that's quite a promise because we've obviously already gone as far as the Fist of the First Men, uh, so we're going beyond that to the lands of always winter. Now, how are we going to get there? Potentially in one of these sort of kind of like a random POV from one of the, the wildlings, maybe maybe something like Ghost. Uh, we're going to get a Ghost chapter almost certainly. John, I think, is going to go into Ghost. Maybe he's going to go ranging north of the wall. But that's still a very long way to go. The most logical way that we're going to get that far north is through Bran. Um, and some sort of astral travel through the Weirwood network. Now, this, um, I think, is quite likely, because what Bran has to do at some point is start helping us uh, patch together what the backstory to this is. We've got so little information about the others in the books. On the show, they started giving us this about this time. In the plot, they started giving us lots of information about the others. But on the show, we haven't had that at all. We've just had random sightings of them, hints about what's going on with uh, Craster's sons and all the rest of it. This is the time, this next book, The Winds of Winter, will be the time when we're going to start learning a little bit more about who they are, what they want and things like that. And the person best place to do that is Bran. So yes, I think we are going to get, and Bran's already looked at it actually. If you go all the way back to the, the book one and his initial visions, Blood Raven's trying to show him why he should be doing all this stuff. He shows them this huge threat way off to the north and Bran sees it. We don't get to see it ourselves, but Bran sees it. And that is part of what drives him. So I think we are going to see a little bit more of what that is. We're going to go to the home of the others in a way. And we're going to understand a little bit more about what drives them and who they are. So uh, yes is the short answer. I think that Bran is going to be going astral traveling north of the wall. Um, Zombie Jesus, thank you so much. Five dollars saying, what are the chances Bran slips up wearing Hodor's skin by say saying something other than Hodor? Or is he even capable of saying anything else? That's a good question. We've not, <coughs> pardon me, we've not really seen this, how this might work. The implication again from the Varamir six, six Skins chapter is that the implication is that yes, a talented 
um, uh, skin change, you would be able to go into another human and sort of take over their life. And that would seem to imply that they would be able to talk and all the rest of it. Now, in terms of making, you know, slipping up while in Hodor, I don't think that that's going to be an issue because he's walking around in Hodor, uh, in Blood Raven's cave. Uh, and I think that Hodor will stay there or thereabouts. I don't think he's going to be holding the door in the exact same sense, but he will hold the door to prevent the others from getting the ran in some way, shape or form. And so Mira seems to know that that's what he's doing. I'm sure Blood Raven knows that's what he's doing, so he's not giving the game away. If he does actually say anything, uh, then that's not it's not a it's not a problem. Uh, so, uh, yes, he may well say stuff. I think that Hodor's vocal cords are certainly capable of saying things other than Hodor. Um, it's simply that his mind is frozen in that moment and he can't move past it. So if Bran is in there, then yes, he definitely could say something, but I don't think it's going to give the game away to anyone because I think all the people around him know already. Um, Joe Magician's in the chat. Hi there, Matt. Good to see you. Um, we have a question from uh, Anne Lieberman. Thank you so much. Didn't see a question from you. Um, oh, yeah, there's one just under here saying, do you think we'll see the Red Comet again before the story ends? Last time it ignited the old powers. What effect would it have the second time around? I don't think so. I think that this was, as you say, the... The, the sort of igniting the powers. This seems to be what was the, uh, what was happening. This this wasn't a one off. There were have been red comets before. There was a red comet um, that Rhaegar saw with the birth of his first son and so on. So this isn't a, a one off. So I wouldn't say no. There's not going to be another red comet. But in terms of the impact on the story, the main impact of that story was very much at that moment in time, and that that there's magic comes from above seems to be this kind of, we don't know the details of it, but that seems to be the hint that we're, we're getting here. Um, we get sort of magical meteorites that make uh, the sword dawn um, and things like that. Magic does seem to come from above. And therefore when the red comet goes over, then that is part of what helped bring magic back into the world. And that was how part of the, the sort of the, perfect storm that allowed Danny to be bringing those dragons to life. Um, I don't think we're going to see the red comet again. I don't think that it's, there's a purpose, a narrative purpose for it there, but it could do because it, this isn't a one-off. This, this kind of thing does happen. Um, and Ben Androvich, thank you so much saying, hi, Robert, you're the absolute best. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I rarely get to pop into the live chat, so I wanted to show my appreciation. Everyone becoming a patron. It's very kind of you to make me say this. Everyone becoming a patron. Robert does some really cool stuff for patrons only. I highly recommend it. Thank you, uh, Ben. I, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I do. I, I prioritize what I do for my patrons. This is why one of the things is priority questions uh, here on live streams, but I do, um, I provide what I do earlier for patrons. So if you if you want to get access to things earlier, I also go at $10 and above, then I give regular chances to influence what videos I make. And also I do uh, content just for my patrons. So this, this week coming, I'm doing my, uh, uh, I was gonna say long promised, I promised it for about a month. Um, uh, the traveler's guide i'm going to do some bonus traveler's guides just for my patrons so uh, yes i do do uh, stuff just for my patrons and ben thank you so much for uh, for making me advertise it on here i do appreciate that very much um and i think i had one more yeah will moss um saying seriously those new 5g weirwoods cause grayscale the Brotherhood without banners is starting to burn them down. You're a stooge of big war big warlock. I am a stooge of big warlock, and I'm not afraid to admit it. Um, uh, 5G weirwoods do not cause grayscale. Uh, attacking the Roinar causes grayscale. Uh, do not attack the Roinar. Um, so um, 
that's that's my policy position is is if in doubt do not attack people with magical water uh with water magic that's uh, that's not a good good thing for you to do um uh, Lady Leaf Underhill saying for which level of patrons. So uh, you get different things at different le levels of patron. I'm very aware some people can't afford any levels of patron, and I hugely appreciate any support people provide. Just so people are aware, $2, uh, you get uh, early access to stuff. You get uh, a chance to have priority questions here on live streams. At $5, you get access to all the audio that I ever produce uh, here on Indie Geek. $10, you get a thanks in the description for every video and chances to um, uh, decide on future uh, or vote on future videos. Uh, $30, um, then I'll ask you what you want. Basically, there's bespoke rewards there. So I've done uh, agreed specific videos for, for patrons at $30 levels and things like that. So, so those are different levels. Um, if you'd like to support the channel, I this is what keeps the channel going, uh, and I hugely appreciate it. Uh, we live in uncertain times. All creative people are having struggling at the moment, um, uh, and so Patreon is literally what keeps this going. So thank you so much. Um, but if you can't be a patron, I completely understand. And if just turning up here and uh, giving it a thumbs up or sharing is is appreciated just as much. I can assure you of that. Um, uh, Donald Peoples saying, just stopping to show love, it's my baby boy's sixth name day. Catch you on the rewatch. Happy birthday uh, uh, for your um, baby boy. I uh, hope you're having a fantastic day. Zach Winchester, thank you for the super chat. Uh, it says message retracted. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, maybe there's, uh, if that was a mistake, uh, please do put the question down into the um uh the, the chat i will try and pick that one up okay let's get back to some questions from my patrons um uh yeah and lady tia says that you can just browse through his well told tale channel if you want him to read to you yeah my well told tale channel is uh, it's my second channel there's a link down in the description i'll just look for the well told tale uh i just read what I think are the best science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. Uh, so if you're into that, uh, you're more than welcome. That's That will always be completely free, uh, the well-told tale. Uh, so please do uh, go and check that one out. So Chase says, hi, Robert, do you think Bran is walking into animals or speaking through weirwood trees trying to communicate with other characters? For example, in one of the Theon Reek chapters, he hears a voice coming from the weirwood. Uh, Bonds asks a similar question, saying, reading back through the books, there are several cases of animals watching certain individuals, two ravens watching Sam when he releases the ravens at the first, the fist of the first men, and he gave a few other examples. Um, so this is um, a short answer is yes. Bran is watching. The Weirwood Network is watching. Blood Raven is watching. This is... Um, connected to a series that I'm just starting, a series of videos I'm just starting, which is sort of the culmination of my uh, very long um, Robert's Rebellion series, Tower of Joy series. The, the end point of that I long promised was going to be a series of videos on this idea of, if in doubt, blame Blood Raven, because all through this, as I've been studying it, it becomes very apparent that Blood Raven's been pulling the strings all the way through. There are things that are just too coincidental. One of the things that you notice more and more, the more times you read these stories, is how often uh, animals are watching, watching the action, particularly ravens. They're watching, sometimes they're talking. Um, uh, so J. Elmore Mont's Raven is a classic example. It's always saying, Things, not just like asking for corn, but it's also um, talking about uh, Jon Snow and saying, King, King, things like that. So it seems to be uh, not just a normal bird. And all the way through the story, the animals seem to be watching. And Blood Raven, um, we know Blood Raven does do this. 
uh, all the way through from when he was just sort of a normal human. Uh, he would use animals to be spying on people. So yes, he definitely does do this. The, I will do a video. So the, the third video, I think, maybe the fourth in this series that I'm talking about with Blood Raven will be focused on this idea of is Blood Raven watching or is Bran watching? Um, it gets a bit blurred between the two of them. A lot of the time, yes, I think that this was Blood Raven, but sometimes now I think we are seeing Bran. Bran does, uh, when he's having these visions through the Weirwood tree, he calls out to his father. He also seems to call out to Theon. Um, this doesn't seem to change history in any way. Uh, but I think that this there is going to be a payoff for all of this, and I wonder whether at least some of that is going to be when Theon, in the Winds of Winter, as I suspect he will, gets taken to a weirwood tree for, to be sacrificed, and I think that is when Theon is going to talk through the trees, and uh, Theon will be rescued. So the answer is that there are a lot. Um, the, the one that I like the most is... J. R. Mormont's Raven, who hangs around long after Mormont's gone, um, who seems to that you you come in and then he seems to be like reading scrolls, and it's just like really he's just like there looking down at the scroll, and then as a character comes in and then he sort of like hops away, and it's like like and says something that implies that that he understood what was in the scroll. It's, it's a fascinating uh, thing and, and really a lot of fun. So I think that Bloodraven does use animals. The other example I would give of Bloodraven probably using an animal is Ghost. Uh, yes, John's direwolf. I think that um, what we see there is that um, the colouring is the same. There's often there's a, a link between Bloodraven's presence and the colouring of something. Ghost is white with red eyes. That's Blood Raven's colouring. So the hint is there already. And he seems to be doing all the things that Blood Raven would want him to be doing. So he finds this cache of stuff that seems like the Dragon Glass and the Horn of Winter, that it seems that Blood Raven wants Jon Snow to get. Um, that that kind of thing. So I think that he has been he has been walking into um ghost and we're told you know when people go well hang on a moment that's john's uh, animal we're told though that once with a wolf in particular once there already is that bond it's easier for a second skin changer to go into them so we've been told that this is entirely possible so now we're just waiting for the payoff and i think that will be the payoff of that um Let's have a quick, I think I've got another question. Uh, Ariel Winchester saying, sorry, somehow my Gmail was changed to my husband's name, Zach. Ah, so that was who, who it was earlier. Just showing love and appreciation. Thank you for all you do. Now, I appreciate it. I think you left a question over on Patreon as well, which I will get to, but thank you so much. Um, uh, that, that cleared uh, that one. Uh, I think that's me caught up on questions from the chat for the moment. Uh, Peter Pebble says, which dragon is Bran going to walk into and what is he going to do with it? This, I, I, this, I think, is an attempt to wind me up. I don't think Bran's going to walk into a dragon. This idea that he was going to walk into a dragon comes from this throwaway line about, you know, Bran says, will I walk again? And he's told, no, but you will fly. And that many people have taken as being, oh, this means that he's going to be a dragon because dragons fly. No, uh, ravens also fly, crows also fly. Uh, but more importantly, I think this is a reference to the fact that Blood Raven was using flight as an analogy for magic. That was right from the beginning with Bran, that was the whole point. You, you showed you, you were falling and if you could fly, that means that you could use magic. And this is basically what Blood Raven is trying to say is that he will use magic. So he doesn't have to walk anymore because he can, he can use magic and go out beyond uh, the, the trees. He doesn't have to do walking places anymore. So, no, I don't think that there's any plot imperative for him to be walking into a dragon. I think that we've 
got a reasonably clear idea on where the dragons are going to be coming into this, and that is not really where Bran is at in this. So sorry, I know lots of people wanted him to walk into a dragon. Um, question from Hobgoblin saying, to what extent do you think that Bran is a victim? While it might seem cool to be a tree wizard, Bran has gone through a great deal to achieve that and will lose who he is. Bloodraven reached out when Bran was extremely vulnerable and capitalised on his vulnerability and childishness, or so it seems to be. Yes, I agree completely. We're not supposed to see Bran as just this amazing, cool tree wizard. We're supposed to recognise the fact that this is a child. And this is very much in line with what Bloodraven is about. Yes, Bloodraven is a really cool and interesting and interesting character. He is trying to do what he thinks is right and does not care if some of that is um, doing things that we might think are wrong or evil, like um, getting a child who was six to start with. We're not talking like a, a nearly adult child. This is a young child. Um, getting them to come all the way to the north through huge amounts of dangers and all the rest of it, um, and then kind of tricking them by, you know, Bran went there thinking he was going to get regain use of his legs, and he's not. Uh, actually, what he's going to do is lose himself into the Weirwood Network. That wasn't part of the deal. That wasn't what he was told. He was told he was going to be, he was going to unlock some of his wizardy powers, and and hopefully he'd be able to walk again. So yes, Bran has been tricked, uh, and tricking children is not a nice thing to do. Bran is indeed a victim. That doesn't mean we always need to feel sorry for him. He does some pretty bad things himself, but it's just another example of George R. R. Martin giving us multi-layered characters. We should feel sorry for him. He is a victim, but that does not make him a perfect person uh, in any sense. So, so yeah, I think that he... Uh, I agree. We should see him as a victim, but that's not all we should see him as. Um, a question from Milton Christopher Appling saying, are there any apparent changes to Bran's story due to the five-year gap? Other characters, uh, fifth-year selves, were replaced by new characters. Do you see any of this with Jodren and Mira's relationship with Bran? I also find the Game of Thrones version of Hodor's origin story unsatisfactory. Please offer me hope that there will be a different version in the book. Well, on that second bit, I, I can offer you a little bit of hope, but not much. I think that the closed time loop, loop of Hodor, um, where Bran goes back into the past and uh, makes him hold the door and that catches uh, Hodor in that moment of time, I think that will happen. Uh, that doesn't mean that all of his backstory is going to be the same, but I think that will happen. Um, in terms of the first part of that, the five-year gap, for those who are unaware, George R. Martin's original idea was that he would start out with, yes, a bunch of very young characters, and then he would uh, have, between books somewhere mid-series, he would have a five-year gap. Now, this was partly because he wanted... Uh, those characters to grow up and partly because hey he just hatched some dragons and it didn't really make sense to him to have massive dragons after only three or four years so he thought you know what we'll wait a few years we'll give everyone a gap and then we'll sort of pick up again he decided eventually against that for a variety of reasons he's not gone into all of the details of that but occasionally you can see the cracks of where he sort of like tried to paper the paper over what's going on. Um, one of them, the most obvious example that I can think of is with Ned Dane, who is, he's a child who appears in the first uh, few books. And uh, it's very obvious that he would have, if he'd had a five-year gap, he would have grown up a lot. Um, and his story, when he's older, appears to have been taken over by Gerald Dane. Darkstar, who was a character who didn't appear in the first few books and then suddenly appeared. So that is a, a, a clear example of how this has happened. For most of the rest of the characters, George R. R. Martin's just kind of like, oh, nah, okay, well, we'll, we'll, I'll write an extra book. It was going to be three books. He's getting on for seven now and they're going to be quite long books. So he's just kind of like said, okay, well, 
they are maybe just a little bit older and you know in the olden days then things did happen when you were younger and you were considered to be grown up when you were a lot younger so he's kind of shrugged about it but um in terms of whether bran this is going to affect bran i think that what we're really going to see is that the big change is not him growing up so much as the impact of being hooked up as part of the weirwood network and what what effect that has on him so um i don't he in, on the show he we, he had a season off of learning and that's largely what we're going to see happen here. He's no, we're not going to have this kind of learning montage. I suspect we will probably have fewer. We definitely did in the last book fewer uh, chapters from him because he is just there learning and imbibing and all the rest of it. Now um, that means that the change is going to happen to him because of something that happens to him rather than because he is naturally getting older. He's still going to come back down as a, as a child, but when I say back down, back down to Winterfell as a child, but this is um, a child who has suddenly got access to huge amounts of memories and information. And when I say memories, information, the, the way that the Weirwood Network operates is that this, this is... Um, memories and lived experiences as a, as a bank. So it, it, he is experiencing things as now because you just see what is happening as now for all these people whose lives and experiences have been sucked up within the Weirwood Network. So that's what's going on. He has suddenly got access to all of this stuff that will make him grow up. So I don't think we're going to see this, this big five-year gap with him. Okay, let's, uh, I think I'm roughly halfway through. Um, uh, and what I normally do uh, roughly halfway through my live streams is just take a moment, I've already said a few things that are coming on in this channel, but just to let you know what's coming up. Um, I'm obviously still covering Westworld. We have five episodes in, we've got three more episodes to go. If, if you enjoy Westworld, do go and check out what I'm doing on that. In terms of A Song of Ice and Fire, as I said, I'm doing this Blood Raven series. Um, I, uh, the first episode of that, I'm hoping well, I'll be able to get out this weekend. That's kind of like a Blood Raven Origins kind of video. The one after that, I'm getting really excited about at the moment. It, everyone has a little bit more time at the moment. And one of the things that I've been spending my time doing is pouring through the Targaryen family tree. Um, uh, that's just how I spend my time, uh, and and I think I've, I think I found something. I think I've spotted something that's going on in there, um, and uh, I think this tells us a lot about what's uh, what Bran, uh, what Blood Raven has been up to, and what his grand plan has been. So, I'm going to do a whole video all about the the effectively the bloodline of the Targaryens and what Blood Raven has been doing, uh, which I'm writing at the moment, and I'm really enjoying doing uh, very nerdy but i'm very really much enjoying it uh so there's that i'm going to follow up with that with a whole series of other videos about a blood raven and possibly while i'm at it because i sort of started getting interested in that as well i might do uh, something that i sort of vaguely said i will do for a while uh, what actually happened at the tragedy at summer hall because i think i've got i've got a reasonable handle now in my mind at least on what Think was going on there um so uh that's all what i've got coming up i'm focusing also on the lord of the rings uh, every week i've got a new lord of the rings video coming out so if you enjoyed that uh check that out too um and uh, finally patrons i was talking about patrons earlier uh thank you i cannot do this quite literally i cannot do what i do without your support so i hugely appreciate that um, if you do want to support the channel, if you do want to get access to some of the benefits that I was talking about a little bit earlier, there is a link down in the description. Uh, that's the best way, as far as I'm concerned, to support uh, creatives, not just me. There are many other creatives who use Patreon as well, so please do go and check out uh, them. And, and if you have got uh, uh, the, the funds to be able to support creatives, then that would be absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much. Um, that's what I've got coming up. And the other thing, uh, The Well-Told Tale. If you love 
great science fiction and fantasy, please do go and check out The Well Told Tale, my second channel. Um, Jake Shepard, thank you so much for a very generous super chat. I really appreciate that. Saying, I missed the John live stream, but I was wondering about your thoughts on the theory that he may be resurrected with white hair and red eyes. Don't deviate from Brown just for me, but if you have time at the end, I'd appreciate it. Great content as usual. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'll, I'll happily deviate very quickly onto this one now. This is a fascinating subject. So the, the, the white hair and red eyes thing, um, we, we don't know. So Ghost, as I've said earlier, does have white hair and red eyes. Um, John, my theory, others believe the same, will probably survive his death and resurrection by walking into Ghost, spending time in Ghost, and then being sort of hauled back in some way into his body when it gets uh, defrosted. Now, when he returns, will he suddenly look different? Probably, probably not ex completely different. I like the idea, but he will have a body which was frozen and then has been defrosted in some way. So it's entirely possible that his colouring may change in some way. Will this give him uh, sort of white skin and red eyes? Possibly. That, as I said, is almost always some sort of a hint across to Blood Raven, who also had white skin and red eyes. So the, I, I wish I could give you a more categorical answer on this one. The, 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 the short answer is that we don't know because we haven't seen it yet. Would it make thematic sense for him to return um, with this kind of Blood Raven imagery? Yes, to a degree, um, because Blood Raven himself is this um, uh, his lineage is Targaryen and first men. He was half Blackwood. And um, so there is a kind of a link across to John, and he has been very much focused in on John and the creation of John. So the link across there would be very strong. If I had to guess, though, probably not. Um, I, I haven't seen any evidence or foreshadowing that says that that's what he's going to look like. Um, uh, I'm very happy if people have got it and want to drop it in the chat, I'll be very happy to look at that. But as it stands right now, I haven't seen anything specifically that tells us that that's what's, uh, that, um, uh, why, uh, that's what he will look like in, in the future. Um, so I like, I like the idea, but, um, uh, I, I haven't seen anything specific. Uh, Didelphi Morphia, thank you so much uh, for the super chat. Haven't seen a question from you there, so I will assume that there isn't, but thank you so much. Um, and I think that's me caught up on chats. Yeah, so uh, Derry saying, talking about um, uh, his body being, John's body being frozen while dead. This is likely to damage his body in some way. Yeah, so... Um, it, it will. So the, the, the imagery, we, yes, this is talking about brand, so I don't want to go into this one too much, but the, the, the foreshadowing is definitely there that John's body is going to be frozen in the ice cells. That there's, uh, If you go back, I did a video on this actually a few months ago, probably in January or something like that. Um, there, if you look at John's last chapter, there is so much uh, imagery that suggests that he's going to be um, frozen in the ice cells and that his his skin will therefore sort of go white or blue or something like that um and he will probably have to be chiseled out almost so that will do things to his body i'm not I'm not a medical person so i don't know what uh, uh, a body that was frozen that was suddenly warmed up again would do but yes it may well change his complexion i don't think it necessarily would send his eyes red but who knows? I'm not sure about that. Um, Niall01 saying, hope you and other creatives are getting by with COVID if possible. Can you ask watchers to consider also supporting sex worker support funds as they're very vulnerable at the moment? Yeah, I'm very happy. And there, there are huge amounts of people across the piece who are uh, affected in this. And I, anyone whose job is um, about 
personal interaction. Sex workers is an obvious example. Massage therapists is another obvious example. These people are hugely affected. And, uh, you know, I, I talk about creatives. I know about creatives because that's what I do. Um, I am very aware I, of, of people whose jobs are 100% based upon being in contact with other people. They are people who very, very, very much need support in some way. Uh, so if you know somebody in those situations, please do uh, do help them out as best you can. The, the way that we can all try not to, to get caught up too much in the sort of the politics of this, but I think this is beyond politics. Uh, the way that we can all move through this is just pulling together, seeing who needs help and helping those people. So if you can see people whose livelihoods have been affected by this in a huge way, and if you can help them, then please do it. It's This world is about paying it forward. And, and so uh, if you can, please do. Um, let's go back to a question from uh, my patrons. Lady Pushkin's um, asking about Blood Raven connection, saying, uh, what do you think is Blood Raven's ultimate intention? Was Brynden Rivers the first Blood Raven? Do you think Blood Raven walked into Bran when he was killed by the Night King? And he planned all this along so he could become the king. How will Blood Raven's death play out in the books? So there's a few questions there. In terms of was um, Brendan Rivers, the first Blood Raven. Yes, this was his nickname because he has a, a birthmark that's sort of reddish and shaped a bit like a raven. Uh, and so he was, that was his nickname, he was Blood Raven. Um, do you think Blood Raven walked into Bran when he was killed by the Night King? This is a show question. Um, no, I think that the, uh, the Weirwood Network as a whole downloaded into him in the show. I suspect it may well be similar ish in the books but not exactly the same um and what is his ultimate intention blood raven is all about what he considers it to be the greater good and that means protecting humanity and protecting westeros because the weirwood network is very much about uh, the natural world as much as anything else and and the the sort of the beating heart of the continent um protecting it against the twin threats of ice and fire. So that is what his main aim is. And uh, now he's part of the Weirwood Network. It was sort of the same when he before he was, in that he was trying to protect the Seven Kingdoms. But at that time, it's a lot more to do with protecting the Targaryen uh, line and rule. Um, Uh, so, uh, got a couple of questions from uh, Huash Nurdin saying, do you think John upon his re resurrection will get white hair? Again, I think it's possible, but I haven't seen any foreshadowing uh, from it. Um, uh, I'm always open to this. This is, I mean, what, what I do, the way I approach all of this is that I don't think I have all of the answers. I think there are some incredibly clever people out there who almost always have been studying the specific thing that I'm thinking about at that time in greater depth than I have. If anyone out there uh, does have some foreshadowing of John changing his complexion, then let me know. Uh, the easiest way is probably via Twitter. Uh, I'm on Twitter. If you look for Indie Geek on Twitter, you'll probably find me there. Okay, um, question from Henning J saying, um, do you think Bran will somehow team up with Rickon again? Or do you think they will stay separated? If I remember right, Rickon hides on the Isle of Skagos, but I can't imagine him staying there until the end of, this, end of the story. Um, yeah, so he is, he got sent off there um, with Osha. Osha seems very competent, so there's every reason to think that they ended up over there. John also via, um, I was going to say, it's a, by the direwolf network is probably the best way of saying it. The, 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 the uh, Stark direwolves are connected. So the, the Starks can often see through one direwolf to another direwolf and see what's going on there. So we see through Shaggy, uh, Ghost to Shaggy Dog and see Rickon there. 
in what looks on what looks to be Skagos. Uh, they have horny goats there, uh, hairy goats, one big horn, um, which created the rumours of unicorns there, it would appear. So that's where Rickon appears to be. He almost certainly is going quite feral. He was quite feral already as a character. Um, he will probably stay there until somebody goes and gets him. However, we know a character who is probably going to go and get him. Uh, <coughs> pardon me, that is Davos. Davos has been sent up there. His his character arc, his story is quite different in the books at this stage anyway. And so he's probably going to go and collect uh, Rickon and bring him back. So he's a long way away. Now, Rickon, I think, will die by the, the law of you, the Stark's fate is bound up in the name of their direwolf. Bran's shaggy dog story, very long story that's long and winding and ultimately meaningless, does seem to imply that it won't really end um, in a happy way for him. So I think that he will die. Will he get back to Windfell and meet Bran? Probably not for very long if he does. I think there are a number of ways that Rickon could die, but I think him coming back to Winterfell and not being there for very long is certainly uh, looking likely for him. Um Agree, Weirwood. Actually, there's a good, good chat going on right now about uh, about John's physicality. Talking about if George R. R. Martin changes John's physicality, he may not have to change his personality much to get the reader to see him as altered. Yeah, John will be almost certainly altered in some way. This is something George R. R. Martin has heavily hinted at, and seems to be the way. If you die and then you come back, you have to lose something. George R. R. Martin has been very clear about this, so he will be changed. And it would, I suppose, make it easier to sell to the reader if he has physically changed in some way, as well as the fact that he's uh, been changed sort of personality-wise. So he will he will lose something. Maybe it, he will lose some of his colouring. Who knows? Um, Maura Lee saying, on the show, the Night King was able to enter Bloodraven's cave and destroy Bloodraven because the Night King had grabbed hold of Bran's arm. Since, as far as we know, there is no lead of the others, how will Bloodraven die in the books? Will Bran inadvertently be the cause of Bloodraven's death in the books like he was on the show? This is a fantastic question, um, and again, this is one that I'm going to say we don't know exactly. No, we do not think that there is a character um, who is the equivalent of the Night King, a leader. Maybe they will have a, a leader there. Who knows? Um, but we don't actually need one for this. What we do have is very probably some kind of protection around Blood Raven's cave. We saw that that uh, that when uh, the uh, the party headed up there in the first place, there were effectively there were skeletons. There were whites camped around the outside of it, so they know it's there. They just can't go in, otherwise the others would have attacked it already. So there is some kind of protection that will have to be broken in some way. I think that there's a, a reasonable chance, given that Bran is um, wandering around inside um, uh, uh, Hodor, is, is not really being trained all that well. Blood Raven's not telling him huge amounts of stuff. It makes... In, complete sense to me that he will do something which will cause the uh, the protection to be broken. Now, we don't know exactly what that is. I don't think it will be exactly the same thing as on the show, but I think that, yes, the, the, the likelihood is that it will get broken by some act that Bran does because he does not understand what he's doing or through Hodor or something like that. We've, we've seen... Um, if you're looking for foreshadowing, um, when they were all hiding in that tower um, south of the wall uh, from the wildlings, uh, and Hodor started to uh, get just very animated and Bran sort of walked into him, that seems to be this kind of foreshadowing of the there are people on the outside and they have to somehow 
hide away from them. It makes sense to me that it is some combination of Bran and Hodor that causes that um, uh, commotion that will allow the, uh, the the bad guys, as it were, to come, come through. Um, uh, Nicholas Ebert saying first time in the live chat. Hi, uh, welcome. Um, there were a few people I saw um, uh, earlier on saying it was their first time in the chat. If this is your first time watching this live, welcome. It's uh, it's a fantastic experience having being here actually in the chat as well, rather than just watching it later. I know lots of people do watch this later, but if you are watching this live for the first time, welcome. It's fantastic to have you here. Um, uh, Barrel Raider says when Catelyn dies, she loses her red hair. Loving this uh, this ongoing chat about what what might happen to your colouring when you uh, when you return from the dead uh, in a song of ice and fire. Um, uh, Maura Lee's asking if ice gets reforged. That's the great um, House Stark uh, Valyrian steel blade, which was broken in two uh, or reforged into two swords. Uh, rather, uh, if it gets reforged and becomes whole again, who will possess it? Will it be Sansa or Bran? My, this is something, actually I've debated, I don't know whether he's still in the chat, but Matt Gemination and I have debated this in the past. Um, I completely buy into the symbolism that you would uh, reforge ice um, from these two Lyrian steel swords and that would therefore be important in the battle against the others. I completely get that. That's, that makes a huge amount of sense to me. However, from a practicality perspective, um, if you've got two Valyrian steel swords and you know that one of the only things that can kill um, others is Valyrian steel swords, why would you reforge them into one and therefore rid yourself of a Valyrian steel sword, particularly if it turns it from two entirely workable swords into one massively long ceremonial sword that isn't intended for battle. So from a sheer practicality perspective, I don't think before a battle against the others, I would reforge uh, ice. Uh, that just is not a thing that I would do. Um, I think it will probably be reforged afterwards uh, and then who gets that? Well, it's the House Stark sword. So whoever is head of House Stark after all this, which for my money probably will be Sansa. Uh, she won't personally use it, but it's more ceremonial than anything else. Um, Leila A. Gushi says, I wonder if Blood Raven can influence Melisandre's visions in the fire. Are there any book references that indicate that possibility? Well, there is a. We get a Melisandre point of view chapter in Dance with Dragons, uh, and she looks into the flames and she sees uh, what is almost certainly Blood Raven and. Bran, so you get man with a sort of a wooden face, and you get Bran, who's like this wolf boy, um, and they're in this place of skulls. Uh, this is clearly a symbolic. Again, this is like when we're on the kind of the spectral plane, then people don't necessarily look exactly who they are. You don't know who those people are. They don't necessarily know what they look like. And then it all kind of mists over. And that seems to be Blood Raven blocking her signal in some way. So, uh, yes, that does seem to imply that you can, that there is a connection between that. They're not operating completely different spheres. It does suggest, as we've, we've thought, that magic is not just lots of mini little magical systems that there is some kind of overall integrated approach to how magic works. It's just that different people do it in different ways. The, the, the themes of magic work across the piece. Uh, the idea that you need sacrifice, for example, is something that seems to work across the piece with, uh, with magic. Um, now, so if, if the two can theoretically interconnect, then yes, Blood Raven could theoretically influence Melisandre's visions. My take is he probably hasn't yet. Um, at least I've not seen it anywhere. Again, if you think you've seen it somewhere, let us know. But um, 
he certainly seems to be able to block himself from her seeing what's going on. Um, just having a quick uh, check through the chat. Um, Uh, Jim Magician saying, I think, picking up on this idea about uh, reforging ice, saying, I think Gendry is around and trained with one of the few people who actually still knows how to work for Lear and Steel Blades is interesting. Yep, yeah, that's true. Um, it does seem to... Did somebody say this is uh, Chekhov's, Chekhov's blacksmith? Possibly, although we haven't been told that he... Specifically told that he knows how to do that. Uh, we just know that he was sort of apprenticing there. So it's entirely possible, um, uh, but uh, we we don't know for sure. Um, and yeah, I, I agree with you saying uh, that the the reforging of ice is more about a healing of House Stark. The idea of Ned's split soul being put back together. Yeah, I, I mean, I I agree. So this is more of a. Uh, a symbolic thing for after the battle rather than uh, trying to actually make a useful weapon for um, uh, for the battle itself. Um, just grab a couple of quick questions before nipping back into the chat um, and uh, into my questions from my patrons. Uh, Annabelle Morales Sanchez saying, what's your opinion on there being a magical or supernatural element to grayscale? Yes, there is. Uh, this comes from... Um, way back in time, the Roinar nation, um, they were, the Valyrian freehold was sort of like attacking them all the time. There's lots of wars between uh, the Roinar and the Valyrian freehold. Um, eventually, there was this good general from the, um, uh, the Roinar uh, called Garin the Great, and he had this series of victories against the Valyrians, and they went, you know what? That's it. And they just completely massacred them. And they uh, headed up, uh, destroyed the army, um, and captured Garin uh, and had him in a cage in his home city, which um, became the Sorrows because he called down this curse, which brought uh, the, the River Roin, uh, which is that they worship the River Roin effectively. And the River Rhoyne washed away uh, this Valyrian army. And ever since then, the Garin's curse, Grayscale, was around. So this comes from a curse. It comes from magic. There is definitely a magical element to it. It does seem to be one of the things that um, those of Valyrian heritage, um, although they seem to be... Uh, pretty good at withstanding most kind of diseases than not so good at withstanding grayscale, which kind of makes sense when you think about what the origin of it was. So yes, it is magical. And it kind of fits in with this idea, I don't know whether it's going to be exactly the same as it was on the show, that uh, there is a magical element, the dragon glass, uh, to uh, curing it. Um, Okay, let's go to a um, question from Ariel Winchester. I uh, Yes, thank you. You, were, you did a super chat earlier um, saying, do you think Bran will try to purge Westeros of the faith of the Seven and have everyone worship the old gods and the weirwoods to increase his strength and abilities? Yeah, so this is a uh, once this is all done kind of question. Um, I think... I don't know because I don't think George R. R. Martin will show us. I think that the story will end when this story ends. We're not going to be seeing what Bran's rule is going to be like. Uh, we're just going to see it up to the point at which he is instated as king. Um, and that's the point at which the story will end. So we're not going to see into the future. Would it make sense that he would uh, try and encourage people to be worshipping the Weirwood Network and all the rest of it? Yeah, of course it would. And I think that 
it would also make sense that people would see the power of this and in the same way that the first men, if you remember the first men didn't originally worship the old gods, they uh, they just came around to it at the time of the pact. Um, this seems to have been connected with the fact that they saw that this was powerful and that they saw that this was uh, important uh, and probably in connection with uh, what happened with the first long night. Now, it would make sense to me if generally people start turning back towards it and seeing that as something real, particularly as the, the faith of the seven hasn't shown itself to be the most effective um, or magical uh, faith or religion out there. So, yes, it kind of makes sense that that is the way the story is going to go. I don't think we're going to see Bran do this. I don't think that he's going to like go out and ban all other religions or anything like that. I think that it's it's going to be something that we will just have to sort of guess at where where he's going to go afterwards. Um, this actually, I just missed one for Peter Pebble saying, what role do you think Bran will play in defeating the others? Um, which is sort of like taking a step back. I think that uh, the, the important point here is that we thought for a long time, I think as a community, we thought Bran must have some big role in defeating the others because this seemed to be where he was going up to the north. He was the one learning about it and all the rest of it. But th for me, out of all of the things that we've learned from the show, the one thing that we have learned that I think is pretty undeniable is what um, his direwolf's name means. Because we've got, uh, for all of the Starks, we've got this clear idea that the name of the direwolf implies the fate of that Stark. And so we've got ghost for John. That means that he's going to die and come back in the way that ghosts do. Um, we've got lady for Sansa, which says that she's going to end up being a lady, probably the lady of Winterfell. Summer, people were sort of scratching their heads for a long time. What does summer mean? What, what can this tell us about Bran's fate? And I think that the big reveal there is that Bran's ultimate role is not so much in bringing about the end of the long night it's actually about ruling beyond winter beyond spring into the summer he's about after the end of the story this is this is his story this is and this, i don't think we can say this enough he was the first character george r martin thought up the first scene that he thought up that one with the uh, the dire wolf cubs he first thought about that with Bran and then tried to think about what other characters might need to be involved in this. And that's the story came out from there. So the story starts with Bran and I think it ends with Bran, which is why we've got Summer. So that seems to be sort of the big arc. That doesn't mean that Bran's not going to do anything in connection with uh, defeating the others. I think that he will bring information. I think that he will... Um, uh, show people how to do it, how to fight them and all the rest of it, but I don't think that he will personally be the key character in all of this. His big role is beyond the end of all of these battles. Um, uh, there are, yes, spring is the end of winter, summer is starting afresh, yes, so that's... Um, uh, that's basically where Bran is. Uh, Bran is at. Um, let's go to a question. Uh, saying Milton, this is connected with the one about um, uh, the faith of the Seven uh, and how Bran will rule. Milton Christopher Appling saying liberal readings of the stories from the Age of Heroes suggest that many of the kings and heroes would have been wargs but obviously the faith made that less possible. How will King Bran handle a bad reaction with the faith or even the small folk? Um, uh, so this be this beyond his being from a house that worships the old God and has no allegiance to the seven. Yeah, I don't think that necessarily, uh, again, we won't see exactly everything that goes on there, but I think that people will see the importance of magic and the old gods and all the rest of it and 
the the line I wish I could remember it verbatim, but the line that um, uh, Sajora comes out with when asked about you know other 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 people crying out for the Targaryens to return, and and he says you know what the small folk what they actually care about the harvests and uh, whether they're going to be fed and do they have a roof over their head those are the things that they really care about not all of this kind of big stuff going on around the rulers and the kings and the queens and all those. I mean, yes, that's nice, but what they really care about their own personal lives. So um, I think that they will accept whoever is in charge as long as they are doing an okay job and looking after the seven kingdoms or six kingdoms or what how many kingdoms we have at the end of this. Uh, so I, d I don't think that they will, yes, they might, uh, they might, as they did with Bloodraven, think oh, that says something going on there, don't particularly like that. But um, firstly, we're not going to see it because it's beyond the scope of these stories. And and secondly, I think if, if, the, if Westeros is ruled well, they will be okay with whoever it is who's doing the ruling. Um, Maura Lee's asking if Bran become, gets to become king, who will become his hand of the king? Now, um, obviously on the show, this was Tyrion. Now, my take on this is that, that it makes sense if it's Tyrion. Tyrion's story has to have a, a satisfactory end um, if we're taking his character arc as a whole. And there, there seem to be a couple of potential endpoints, one of which is that he ends up inheriting Casterly Rock, because this was the thing that right from the beginning, his father didn't want him to be inheriting it. Um, he said, you're not, you know, you're no son of mine and all the rest of it. So if he ends up inheriting Casterly Rock at the end of all of this, then that makes a lot of sense for him. Um, but secondly, uh, if he ends up as Hand of the King, that definitely seems to be, again, he's taking over from his father, who was Hand of the King for you know, most of his adult life. And the him being the Hand does seem to be where he naturally should be. He, We have one book of him being the Hand, and he's doing a sensible job. He's doing a good job. He he helps protect King's Landing from um, invasion, from Stannis's attack, uh, and and he he does sensible things. He roots out spies. He does all you know, gets Dawn back involved in supporting um, what's going on, uh, ostensibly at least. Uh, he does well but he does not get the recognition for it. Um, and he gets harried out of, well, say, harried out of King's Landing. Uh, he gets accused of things he uh, that he didn't do, um, and he has to escape. And that is the other logical end piece for where he is, is to come back to where he was actually at his best. That was when we see Tyrion at his best, and he gets the chance to, to do it. So um, I think he is by a long way the most obvious uh, thematically person to be the Hand of the King. Um, there are obviously other possibilities. Davos would probably make a good uh, Hand of the King. Um, but in terms of uh, the Bran link to somebody, Tyrion was accused effectively of being a person who tried to assassinate Bran. That's the whole, where the whole thing, this is where Catelyn tried to arrest him and, and all the rest of it because she thought that he was trying to kill Bran. Um, and, but actually what Tyrion did when he came back from the wall, he passed through Winterfell and he tried to help Bran. And I don't think Bran will forget that, the fact that, that Tyrion he didn't have to help him. Everyone, he was being treated really quite badly by the Starks there when he came back. 
Um, but he proactively tried to help him. He designed him that saddle and all the rest of it. And it makes sense if that connection that those two had uh, as Bran, this is where Tyrion's famous line about uh, uh, cripples, bastards and broken things comes from. They had a connection, they had a link, and it makes sense makes sense if that comes back around again at the end. So I think Tyrion is the most likely person uh, to win there, not just because I like Tyrion as a character, um, but because it's sort of where the character arcs uh, are going. Um, we've got, I think, one more question from my patrons. So now is a good time if you want to be dropping some questions into the chat. I, we've, got, uh, we've got a few more minutes to go yet, I think. Um, uh, so let's have a quick flick through. Uh, if you do want to drop any, now's a good time to do it. Um, Carl Karsnark says, uh, I'm a sentimental fool, but I want Tyrion and Sansa to live happily ever after in the North. I don't care if it's cheesy, I want it anyway. Well, yeah, this is, again, this is another possibility with uh, Tyrion and Sansa. Um, there are, and we, talk, we talked about this last week, actually, with Sansa, Sansa's arc is that she needs to get to a place where she is in control of her own destiny and she's not actually, she no longer has these controlling men around her who are trying to use her and all the rest of it. And the bizarrely, the only time that she actually, after she left Winterfell, that she actually had people that she knew that she could trust was in King's Landing when there was the Hound who had this connection with her and there was Tyrion. Tyrion married her, but he refused to touch her until she wanted it. And uh, she didn't, <laughs> but later on in the previous chapter of the Winds of Winter, when we get Sansa's chapter, she thinks back and goes, you know what, actually, he wasn't that bad, was he? Um, it's not about what's on the outside, it's what's about on the inside. And so, out of all of the people who've been sort of characters who are associated with her, he is actually the one, probably the only one that she could completely trust. So it is a possibility that uh, Sansa and Tyrion get together, added to which there's the, the War of the Roses thing that I went into last time that um, I won't go into uh, now, but uh, the end of the War of the Roses high level was that House uh, York and House uh, Lancaster came together in a marriage. Uh, Stark is based on York. Lannister is based on Lan Lancaster. Who are the only two Starks and Lan Lannisters who are likely to get married? It, Tyrion and Sansa. So that's a, it's a possibility. Um, but I think that it's the bigger possibility is that Sansa will be uh, up in the north and Tyrion will be down in the south. Um, uh, Chrissy of Oldstones, thank you, are saying uh, from a first time watcher, Adam Kane. Adam, welcome. Uh, saying, does Bran speak through time to make Arya cross the yard to escape King's Landing in the first book? She hears a voice in her head that makes her jump. Um, I would have to reread that, I have to say, um, because off, off the top of my head, I don't know. The it may well be um, Bloodraven rather than Bran. Now, the, the reason I say that is that, yes, Bran does seem to be able to sort of say things to people in, uh, in the past. He seems to say something to his father through the Weirwood Tree. But what we get from Bloodraven is that you can't change the past. So Bran, I don't think Bran is going to sort of suddenly look through the Weirwood network and go, oh, hang on a moment, there's Arya, she need, she's going to get killed unless I do something now. That doesn't seem to be the way that it works. Possibly Bloodraven might have used uh, an, an animal in some way to um, uh, be sort of warning her. I, th I think he will definitely have seen that she has a role to play in the future. The Starks, all of the Starks have, he provided them, I'm personally convinced, he provided them with their direwolves, and so he knows the future about what's going on there. So I don't think it will have been 
brand, but it might well have been Blood Raven. But I have to have a look back to see it. There's there's a lot, and th this is how, and when I've been doing this series on Blood Raven, this is something that comes out again and again, is that it, it's really well written because there are huge amounts of times when you think, oh, that was that was that Blood Raven doing something? Did somebody sort of like thinks they might have heard something? Does that mean it was Blood Raven? We will never actually know. Blood Raven is not calling attention to himself. He is deliberately hiding in the shadows, influencing things. I think one way that he definitely did, if you go back to that first Bran chapter, when calling attention, Bran does hear something, and that means that he sort of stops and they find the diables and all the rest of it. That I'm absolutely certain was Blood Raven. Could he have been doing the same thing for, uh, elsewhere, so for, with Arya, then possibly? Um, uh, Sorry, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce your name, but do you think Bran will bring Dark Sister back south of the wall? Yes, I think, well, I think that Mira will. Um, Dark Sister was the Valyrian steel sword that Blood Raven had. Um, as we know that he took it up to uh, the wall with him. It's not at the wall, so it makes sense that he took it north of the wall with him. Um, and it's one of those things on the show. They did pause for a moment to show Mira grab a sword. That's the kind of thing they used to do on the show as a sort of a nod to, we're not going to cover this on the show, but hey, book people, this is to tell you that we know there's a bigger thing happening here. For example, they lingered on what was almost certainly the Horn of Winter. They lingered on the Sword of Dawn. Um, there was no reason for them to do either of those things unless they're saying, yeah, we know that this is important, but we're not going to talk about it on the show because we've not got time. So I think Mira will take that sword back down uh, with her. Uh, maybe that makes her uh, the Dark Sister. Um, final question from my patrons. The Stark in Winterfell says this is an overall overall Stark question. What do you think? Ro why do you think Rob never had any POV chapters? Everyone else did except Rickon, and he's a baby. Um, I think this is interesting because, um, and this is going to sound like a weird thing to say, George R. R. Martin, I think, does not want to have too many different POVs. And I think it's a weird thing to say because he clearly has lots of different POVs. But if he can tell a story without having an extra POV, then I think he does it. In book one, there actually was quite a limited stock of stories, stock of POVs. Um, what you will find is that uh, you only get a POV from a character if we need to see what's happening in that branch of the story. So we have Arya, so we know what's going on with Arya. We have Littlefinger, we have um, Sansa. We don't need a Littlefinger chapter because we can see what's going on there without having a Littlefinger chapter. We didn't need a Rob one because we had Catelyn. We did need Catelyn uh, for other reasons. Um, and then when characters get introduced, it's because there's with a POV chapter, it means that something's going that only they can show us. So, for example, uh, Melisandre having a POV chapter in the last book is not just a random thing. I'm absolutely convinced of this. Yes, it told us a few extra things. But what it means is that we are now, we're going to see what happens next at Winterfell through her eyes. Because... We have been get sorry, Winterfell at uh, Castle Black, sorry, because we have been seeing this through John's eyes all this time. John is going to die. Yes, we might get a ghost POV from him. I really hope we do. But in terms of understanding what's going on at Castle Black while John is dead, the character that we're going to see this through, I'm pretty certain, is going to be Melisandre. So that's why we suddenly get this Melisandre uh, POV. Uh, being introduced. Um, similarly with Area Hotel and things like that, because those are things that we just need to have those. And we get John Connington being introduced because um, uh, his, uh, we could see the first part of what was going on through Tyrion, but when Tyrion's moved off, we still need to know what's happening with this invasion. So that's why we get John Connington uh, chapters. So that's a slightly long and convoluted way of saying that George R. R. Martin only gives us POV chapters from characters where we need to see what's happening in that bit of 
the story. With Rob, he was never on his own with a vital important bit of plot going on where we there weren't other characters there as well whose uh, POVs we could look through. So he, George R. R. Martin did not introduce one because he did not need to introduce one. With Rick on, it's a similar, yes, you're right, he's a, he's very young. Uh, with Rick on, we, we didn't need to know the fact his going over to um, Skagos, we will find out when he gets picked up, I suspect, by Davos. And that's that's the point at which we, we won't need a new Rick on POV. We've got Davos's POV who can uh, carry on with that story. Um, so, yes, this is one of those examples of actually George R. R. Martin is trying to limit the amount of writing that he's doing, which is um, uh, not the kind of... Um, uh, thing you normally say about George R. R. Martin, he doesn't normally like to limit stuff. Um, uh, Abdurrahman Chebi saying, Patchface in the Winds of Winter. Yes, Patchface will be in the Winds of Winter. We're not going to have a POV chapter there, but he will be around. Um, uh, Robinson 88 saying, I believe it was Preston Jacobs who pointed out many of Marwin's associates meet in and around the Crossroads Inn. So very close, close to the God's eye. I don't know the context of that, but uh, as, as, as we pointed out a number of times, the centre, the thematic centre of this story is not actually Winterfell or King's Landing or anything like that. It is that small area around the God's eye, Harren Hall and the Inn at the Crossroads. The Inn at the Crossroads is um, it's a place of decisions and it's a place of where where things could go either way, uh, and we see it again and again. Uh, for example, this is where Catelyn uh, picks up Tyrion and takes him off uh, to the Eyrie, and that kickstarts all of the, the war, basically. It's also where um, Rhaegar and Lyanna got together and headed off. We don't know exactly it was the Inn at the Crossroads. It makes a lot of sense that it was, but we are told that it was close to Harren Hall, so it's around that area. So the, the idea that this is where people might meet uh, certainly makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't know about um, Marwyn's associates meet in and around there. That's uh, it's, it's an interesting observation if it's, uh, if it's true, and I'm sure it is. Um... Christy Volstone saying, we need a stream on Patchface and a stream on Weirwoods. Okay, well, I will happily do one on Weirwoods. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a video on um, Patchface first. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether there's enough for an entire live stream on him. Fascinating character, though, he is, So, but I will happily do that. Um, okay, uh, I've come to the end of my questions from patrons, so I'm just going to pick up a last couple of questions from um, uh, the, uh, the chat. Um, Carl Karsnark saying, <laughs> only if Robert paints himself in Motley. That's not happening. Um, uh, thank you, though. Um, quick flick through. We've got, oh, I had just uh, Lady Tia. Thank you so much for the super chat saying, love this live stream. Excellent as always. Keep up the good work and thank you for your, all your amazing content. Thank you so much. Um, um, and somebody's saying, uh, uh, Barrel Raider saying, I like your name. Good luck getting your question answered. Well, I will have a very quick flick through and I'll make, make this one the last question I come to if I can find it. Um, if I can't, then. Uh, so Barrel Raider saying, do you think our brand could be Brandon the Builder? OK, this is a good question to end with, isn't it? So this was. Um, as uh, so all the brands going through Stark history, and there are a lot of brands, um, it, this has created the theory that perhaps they are all the same, or perhaps the brand we have now is in some kind of time loop that he is actually Brand the Builder. Brand the Builder being the founder of House Stark, being the person who uh, apparently built the wall, Winterfell. Uh, Storm's End and possibly also the High Tower. Um, so there's a, a that that's who he is. He's this legendary character. Um, 
George R. R. Martin is very clear about his legendary characters that that we shouldn't take them too literally. They are a long time in the past and they are gone. Could this Bran be that Bran? I mean, it's possible, but I just don't. Personally, I just don't like it. I don't think it's necessary. Um, I the that Bran clearly was a magic user, so that Bran perhaps did end up in. Um, when I say he clearly was a magic user, he seems to be working with, uh, according to the legends anyway, with Children of the Forest. He seems to be working with giants. Uh, and if he did build Storm's End, Storm's End clearly has some magical protections. If he did build the wall, then that clearly has magical protections. Um, Winterfell is clearly magical. So there's l the, the implication is that he is a magic user of some kind. Does that mean he was a green seer? That is entirely possible. If so, he may well be sucked up within the Weirwood network. Um, that would make sense. Uh, and if our current brand gets sucked up within the Weirwood network, then they would indeed come as one. Uh, so in that sense, yes, possibly they are the same. I don't, however, buy into the kind of time travel theory that Bran has somehow goes back in and lives the life of the original Bran, the builder. Um, yes, that would be some kind of a weird closed time loop in the way that we've been uh, seeing with things like uh, Hodor, but um, I don't think it adds anything to this story. I think it, it the story itself, as far as the Weirwood Network and Bran, going seems to be a whole lot more everybody's experiences get added in to this network rather than this one specific person goes back and is actually really secretly that other secret person in the past that's not the way this seems to be going but I think it's a fascinating question uh, and I think that there is a connection and I think George R. R. Martin is trying to encourage us to think of that connection but I don't think it's going to be that clear and binary I think um, okay, so uh, I think that one is um, uh, the last question. Uh, thank you uh, so much. I've really enjoyed this chat. Um, as always, I've just noticed my hair is a little bit uh, getting quarantine hair. Anyway, uh, the uh, as always, uh, if you're watching this back later on, then somewhere around here will be a link to other live streams that I've been doing. A link somewhere to here is a link to my Patreon page if you want to support the channel uh, or if you want to get access to some of the stuff I do exclusively for my patrons, please click on there. I'll be back again this time next week with uh, another live stream. Um, I think I will make this one um, about another character. This, I'm enjoying this series, going through looking at characters um, uh, in... Um, uh, in the winds of winter um oh, just spotted um uh, sonata systems thank you so much for super chat saying a governor of new mexico has george locked down should be finishing the book soon well fingers crossed on that one um uh i don't know whether um he's certainly working on it i think that's all we can say on uh, at this stage um he is he said he's he's locked down he's producing it um uh, and that's that's about it. I've given up trying to predict when it's going to be. Um, I'm hoping soon. Uh, we are nearly there. I'm almost certain of it, but, uh, but um, who knows? It's going to be big when it comes out. That's uh, that's what I do know. Anyway, uh, as I was saying, so somewhere up here, if you're watching later, will be linked to other live streams. Somewhere up here, if you're watching a bit later, will be a link to my Patreon page. If you want to support the channel or get access to some stuff, I do just for my patrons. Take care, everyone. I will see you again next week.